Coach DeMarco here with another episode of Get Better Basketball Live. Today I'm going to discuss building a defensive system with Coach Tony Miller of Bob Jones University. Coach Miller is an assistant coach at Bob Jones University, and he also is the host of the Quick Timeout podcast. Coach Miller is very active on social media, contributing to Fast Model, hosting his own podcast, and is always willing to share with other coaches. I'm so excited to have Coach Miller here with us today. Get Better Basketball Live is up next. Coach DeMarco here with another Get Better Basketball Live and fortunate to have Tony Miller uh, with me as my guest today. Tony is an assistant basketball coach at Bob Jones University and very involved on social media, including hosting his own podcast. Tony, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on today. I know you're going to talk a little bit about building a defensive system and aligning your half court and full court defense. But before we get into that, I, I love what you're doing on social media. I love what you're doing with your podcast and that uh, quick timeout and then coffee with the coaches. Um, can you tell coaches a, a little bit about your podcast and then maybe about coffee with the coaches as well? Yeah, so I started the podcast about a year ago when I started it, the name of it, obviously, a quick timeout. I was hoping to give coaches something that they could get kind of a few coaching nuggets in a 10 to 12 minute segment. Um, but since that time, I had some feedback from coaches were saying, man, I, I loved what you were talking about, but it, I didn't get enough of it. And so I was trying to find the sweet spot between going on for 45 minutes or an hour a lot of shows do that, and that's fine, but I, I wanted it, again, to fit into the busy schedule of coaches. They can listen to it on the way to a, an away game or, you know, in between classes during a prep period or something like that. So um, that, that's kind of how it got started. I, I wanted to have a variety of guests. There's plenty of other podcasts out there that do very similar to what I'm trying to do, but this one, I, I wanted it to be something, again, where a coach could leave having listened to a specific topic gotten two or three coaching nuggets and been able to go on their way. And so um, that's kind of how it started and it's evolved to the coffee with coaches. That's, it's really kind of like a sub podcast or a sub episode series, sub series to the podcast. Um, it's live on Twitter and Facebook. I, I usually do it either Friday or Saturday mornings. And um, it's just usually a video that's streamed on Twitter and Facebook that we talk about a lot of the same things, but it's a little bit less basketball tactics, um, you know, X's and O's, and it's a little bit more culture. We've talked about social media. We've talked about the player coach relationship. I mean, it's a little bit different leadership, that kind of thing. So it's a little bit different. Um, and then I end up re-airing those eventually down the road. And so you'll see those pop up again. But, you know, it's all really just I, I've got in the title of the podcast. It's really just an effort to grow the game. There's so many resources that are available that I'm just trying to provide some additional resources um, for coaches to have. Well, Coach, I always appreciate, you know, all that you share out there with other coaches so much that. Um, in my uh, weekly newsletter that I put out, I, I share your podcast out a lot, actually. I just shared uh, one awesome. of your podcasts that I had just listened to um, recently with uh, Coach Casio on it. Um, yeah. So I shared that out this week. And I, I love the, as you mentioned, sort of that sweet spot. It's not super long. It's not too short. It's, it's kind of yeah. nice for a listen. You jump in the car, you put it on, and, um, you know, you do a great job with it. So I, I appreciate all that you have to share. And I know that today you're going to talk uh, defense. So if you give us a little bit of a background about um, what we're going to see today, I know you have some diagrams and stuff you're going to share as well. Yeah, so just kind of how this came about. Um, I, I started with our program there at Bob Jones in 2012. That's when we actually first started the program. And I was in a kind of a director of ops volunteer assistant role those first few years. And then um, we had a turnover in, in coaches, not because the guy got fired, but it, he was the athletic director as well. And so he went to become the full-time AD. We brought in a head coach. Um, it was something where I, I'm, I teach at the university and I'm in charge of some programs there. And I, as strange as it sounds, at least for a while, I want to be an assistant coach for a long time. I like the responsibilities. I like not having to deal with some of the things that the head coach deals with. 
but the guy who came in was actually a, a, a friend of mine. And so we had already known each other, had had a friendship for a while. And so he felt comfortable enough from the very beginning. And it's his personality too. But I think us having known each other and him knowing me before he gave me the defense and said, you know, it's all yours. You know, I'll do the offense, but you can do the defense and have everything with that. And so um, as we've kind of progressed, this is year, we're about to start year four together. As that's progressed, he's he's wanted to press a little bit more. And that was something that I didn't know a ton about. He has done some great jobs, won a ton of, of high school state championships with it. And and so we had been the first about five or six years of the program, a pack line defense team. And it was kind of more so a little bit out of necessity just because of the type of players that we had. But because we wanted to press a little bit more, those two styles kind of conflicted in certain areas. Um, and so I firmly believe that you can be a pack line team or at least kind of like a gap defensive team and press and those things not oppose each other, but some changes had to be made. And so I kind of wanted to adjust things as what we did in the half court to be able to fit a little bit better what we did in the full court. You know, your listeners, I'm sure you, you think about the game in those four phases, right? Like your transition offense, offense, transition defense and then defense. And so I wanted there to be a better flow to it rather than just having kind of like four chunks of we do these things. Why? Well, because we've always done it like that, right? And so, you know, trying to pair the two things just as we're talking today, the transition defense and then the half court defense. Um, and some of the things that, that we can talk about that I'll show you too, kind of minor adjustments. We didn't completely throw out pack line defense. We didn't completely become a denial team. But there are some things that changed. I mean, even in the half court, um, I, I think you've we've at least talked about it in the chats on Wednesday nights before, but even talking about like ball screen coverage um, and, and making sure that those things are all connected. Because again, I once the game starts going and your players just start playing, I didn't want there to be confusion or kind of like those mental blocks that, oh, wait, am I supposed to do it this way? We're in the half court. I, I wanted things to flow. And so it's changed the things that we've done in the last year, year and a half. Um, you know, it, it can continue to change based off of the type of players that we're recruiting, but trying to kind of stay ahead of the curve with doing some of the things that maybe are being done a little bit more frequently at the higher levels um, and trying to bring that down to where we're at. Just a quick question before we jump into some of the, uh, the visuals. Um, what type of uh, full court pressure are, are you using? Is it zone pressure or man pressure? And have you seen some success already as you've sort of transitioned and, and been using a little bit more of the pressure defense? Uh, two years ago, so not this last season, but the season before, we had wanted to make the jump to having a little bit more pressure and kind of speeding up the game a little bit more. Um, but we were plagued with injuries. And so what ended up happening was we – primarily became a zone pressing team, which of course, the way that we played it, at least, it doesn't always have to be this way, but the way that we played it would would slow down some of the faster teams. We play down here in the South, Bob Jones is in, in South Carolina. Um, you know, it's kind of the levels that we play at, we play a lot of NCAA Division II schools. Um, we just became a Division Three provisional school. So um, a lot of athletes, NAIA, um, even some of the NCCA teams that we play, super quick, super athletic. And to be honest with you, we didn't have those type of players. And so uh, two years ago, it was more of the zone trying to slow it and control pace. And again, that kind of fit a little bit better with what we were doing in the half court with the pack line defense. But this last year, we recruited a ton of kids, <clears throat> played at times 10, 11, 12 guys. And so it, it was more of a, a man to man style um, even our, our zone kind of became a pressure zone where we'd have some traps in certain places on the floor. Um, kind of something interesting with that. I can talk about it. I observed it on the sideline. I, I've, I know it better now, but I actually let the head coach is he would te teach the full court pressure defense and then I would take the half court. We've kind of evolved even in, in how we do that. I actually do some of the offense too. So we kind of have our fingers, both of us, in a little bit of everything. And I think it's been good for us because it's allowed us to align those four segments of the game a little bit better. I think we can continue to improve in those. But, um, you know, going back to your original question, will we'll man press? Um, we play a 2-2-1 two, two, press. And then we actually sometimes will also play a 2-1-2 two, two full court press. 
which is a little unique and has some uh, idiosyncrasies syncrasies to it that are a little bit different and make it a little bit different and harder for teams to prepare, especially if you get them with it and surprise them with it, you know, in certain points of the game. So those are the three that we stick with. Um, and then once it gets to the half court, I think if I, you know, I mentioned pack line and if, when you mention that coaches usually think I drop back and sit in almost the zone looking type defense. And again, there are elements to that, but you know, the way that it's evolved, we've tried to make it our own and make it a, a kind of a defense that, you know, that has elements of that, but then also, you know, to, not denial, but, you know, put pressure on the ball, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, the, the pairing of the two of them has definitely improved. And uh, I'll sh I can show you some things that we do that, that hopefully will kind of make that, make that sound a little bit more understandable. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this because, um, you know, I, I ran a full court pressure defense and we were a little bit more um, deny and, and kind of really getting out in the passing lanes and started to shift my last couple of years and a little bit less of that. So I'm very interested in seeing what you guys are doing and how you're managing, you know, some of the pack line elements because there's so many good things about that defense and then also with the pressure defense. So I'm, I'm very interested to see this today. And I know that you have some visuals. So why don't we take a look at um, some of the diagrams that you have? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just talk a little bit about our full court and then kind of how that shifts and morphs into our, our half court defense. But, you know, for us, when we're, when we're pressing, you know, there'll be some times where obviously we're trying to get steals. Other times we're trying to control tempo. That's usually when we switch over to our zone press. Um, but even our zone press can be one that uh, is attempting to speed up. Um, you know, it, again, it has some of those principles of being in a gap uh, per se. You know, it's not going to kill us if a team goes backwards or goes laterally, right? But if they get the ball to the middle, or get the ball quickly up the sideline after a quick rotation, that's what's going to kill you. And so, it, again, it's kind of the same principles and ideas of keeping the ball out of the middle of the paint. And you can see that even here in this diagram. So this is something that is not unique to me. This is in the half court. And, again, our players are already thinking keep the ball on one side of the floor, right? And so we want to keep the ball to one side of the floor. To one side of the floor. We want to keep the ball out of that paint. And so what we will teach them, this is something that I've got from somebody that I know you know, Coach, and have seen online is, is Randy Sherman at Radius Athletics. And so um, he actually teaches and is, is when we talk about half court and teaching it, this is the first year that we taught this. And I feel like it really helped our players understand and visualize. And it allowed me to communicate during a game to them and remind them with those, those uh, terminology cues of what we're trying to do. And you can see here in the first – uh, diagram on the left, we talk about we want to basically push them down the roof. And then what I say is once we get them down the roof to about that coaching line there, we want to then push them down the gutter. And so we'll actually practice on the right here. You can see we'll start with the ball here at half court. And sometimes I'll actually put another line over on this side of the floor <clears throat> and have them practicing the same side, same thing on this side of the floor. But we'll just practice keep pushing them down the roof and then pushing them down the gutter here to the outside. And again, if you're a pack line coach, you're looking at that and saying that goes opposite of what pack line is, where you're kind of influencing towards the center of the floor or even facing up and allowing them to go one way or the other, but not allowing them to get that deep paint touch. And so again, in our full court pressure defense, we're constantly trying to shrink the floor by keeping them on one half of the floor, one half of the court. But what was happening was once we broke that, and broke that, the players didn't necessarily know where or when that, when the press was over or when that full court mentality was over. And so what we were having was they were getting into the half court. Once they got there into the half court, we were now telling them, okay, now influence towards the center of the floor. And I feel like that just kind of caused some confusion of when we're going to do this and what we're going to do. And so we just decided we're going to kind of keep to the outside of the floor. And it also, you know, we talk about the analytics bring, being brought into it. We talk about any time that the ball crosses that midline, which I have it represented here with this red, red dash line. But anytime you cross the ball of that midline, we all know that the team's the offense's field goal percentage immediately increases. And so I was basically telling our players, keep them to one side of the floor in the press. But then once we got in the half court, we said, you know, it's okay if the ball crosses that midline. And I just felt like it went against some of the things that we at our core believed and what we were trying to accomplish 
you know, and again, too, some people don't like pack line because they think it means that you're just kind of giving up the middle, which isn't true, but it still happens sometimes. And we were doing a better job of down the roof, down the gutter, keep them outside of the paint with this philosophy. And so from day one, we started teaching them down the roof, down the gutter, and allowed me during the games, like I said, once the ball would cross over half court, especially in transition defense, that ball is being brought quickly down the floor. I would just say, roof, 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 roof. Sounds like I'm barking, but I'm, I'm basically just telling the players, keep that ball to one side of the floor, push it down the roof, and once it gets down the roof, don't let it come back to the middle. And basically, it allowed us to shrink that side of the floor and now play because typically you're ending up with the ball here and in a press or in a press off or excuse me, in a transition offense scenario, you've got a player here in the corner with their defender. And it basically allows me again to keep kind of the ball on that side of the floor where I've got fewer, fewer offensive play or fewer um, possibilities for them to be able to get into those double or triple gaps. Coach, can I just, can I just ask, um, is there anything that determines which side of the floor you might push the, the opponent to, or is it really once they go right and they're on that right side, you're keeping them there. And then I guess my second kind of follow up to that is um, with the baseline, what's your strategy there? You guys give that up, not give it up, obviously, but allow that or do you force middle from when the ball's in the corner? Just curious in terms of some of the principles as coaches are, are watching this. And I, and I have to say, I love what you're doing in terms of, from the full court and then into the half court. Um, I, I really like what I'm seeing. Yeah, I mean, ideally you would love to push them to their weak hand, but let's be honest, during the during a game, you're basically scrambling, right? In a, in a transition defense scenario. So I was more concerned with them keeping their guy to one side of the floor because I don't know, you know what you teach, but for us, we're teaching, we wanna cross the street earlier. We wanna get the ball across that middle third as quickly as possible. So if, I, if, if I'm telling my team that, I know other coaches are telling their team that. So if I can limit that by putting ball pressure early and then keeping them to one side of the floor, I'm really more concerned that we keep them to one side of the floor rather than you have to push them to their left hand or push them to their right hand. Because again, I'm more concerned with them not crossing the midline than I am with them you know, going to their weak hand. Because yes, individually you may do a better job on a player if you're pushing them to their weak hand but let's be honest as soon as that starts happening they're going to probably give the ball up and so as soon as they give the ball up if that's something where they're crossing the midline then you're probably going to lose that advantage that you had anywhere so this again kind of fits into to our our transition defense you know putting the guy at the elbow or even nowadays where you have offensive players that are just sprinting to the three point line making sure that we're in those gaps, right? And so making sure that we're in the gaps and if the ball's being driven at us in the corner that we're closing out and, and to taking away the corner shooter. Um, you talk about pushing them down the roof. <clears throat> there is a difference, and this is something that we've had to instill in our players into their minds from, the, from day one, is it's okay for an offensive player to drive you towards the baseline it's not okay for them to beat you and for you to give up the baseline. Like those are two different things. And there were, there were too many times early on where we were so adamant about no, nothing outside, nothing outside, nothing outside that when it happened, we were like, we were mad at our players. But the truth of the matter is like, it just happens sometimes. Like there's players that are athletic. I want them to have like this not give up attitude. And that's where I have the, 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 the cone down there in the short corner, if you start to get driven baseline, that's okay, but you have to now angle yourself and move quickly to the point where you can cut them off at that baseline spot. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes you end up happy, you could potentially tell that could be a trapping spot, right? So you could tell your post player, that's where we want to trap. And then, you know, that, that opens up a whole, you know, help and recover and rotations and that kind of thing too. But from a one-on-one -on -one standpoint, it's okay if your guy starts to drive you baseline. It's not okay. We want to level them off is a term sometimes that, you know, pack line coaches will use. But it's okay, We but we have to level them off to that cone there. We can't give up a baseline drive. So, again, that's one of those things that I think maybe sounds like semantics to coaches. But really, I think if you teach it to your players, they'll understand and 
they actually get pumped about it when they when they get a stop there in the short corner and actually like encourages them <clears throat> and motivates them to keep playing tough defense because I, I I got him cut off in the baseline. He didn't beat me baseline, you know, and then they start clapping and getting pumped up and whatever. So, you know, I, I think that's a key difference because that was one thing. I mean, you know, it's a good question. That was one thing that I didn't like about the pack line was that we were at times practicing getting beat on the baseline so that we could practice for when it happened in a real game. And there was just something messed up about that because you're, you're practicing not doing what you want to happen and you're okay with it because, you know, it's going to happen in the game. So we better go ahead and practice it. And so I, I didn't like that part of the pack line. Yeah. I love the, the never give up mentality there on, on the baseline. And the truth is it's going to, it's going to happen. And if you instill the mentality that you guys are instilling into your players, beat them to the spot and try to get back and recover. I think that's so important. And, Love the point, too, about just keeping the player on that side of the floor. I can see so many advantages to what you guys are doing, and it's kind of got the, the wheels spinning here. So I'm excited to yeah. see what's up next. I'll, well, and I'll say this, too, if you think about it, because at some point you you were probably going to ask me about ball screen defense. and Because, again, as the game continues to move towards so many ball screens, even if at the high school level you're not facing them a lot, you're going to at some point during the year face a guy who's just he's awesome in the ball screens and that's what they run at somewhere most likely right and so for us we face that all the time at the college level and again uh, we were trying to be kind of proactive more so at the forefront um, at our in our league and we started icing ball screens or downing ball screens uh, two or three years ago and it, it wasn't being done a lot and if you think about what icing or downing is, you're pushing them towards the outside of the floor. And that, confl that conflicts with pack line teams. It, you can do it. I mean, but, but if you look at a Virginia, like they're hard hedging. And to be honest with you, like our, our bigs were not athletic and not good enough and couldn't anticipate like players at Virginia. Like it was just different. And so we were trying to teach downing and icing. But again, that goes against influencing towards the center of the floor. And so again, get that, that inconsistency, at least for me, even if the players didn't understand it, I just had a problem with teaching something like that. And then again, teaching them in the half court. <clears throat> I think probably what I'm trying to say is when you start, when there are not consistencies in what you're, what you're doing, your style across the board, you start introducing more if-thens. But if this happens, then this, if this, then this, and th if this, then this, and you end up with this so long list of if thens that you can't even remember all the if thens, but you're expecting your players to react instinctively to those things in a game. And it's just not going to happen. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm trying to eliminate the if thens and create continuity so that they can react and play quick. Yeah, I really like that. And I was going to ask too, um, you know, thinking about as the ball gets into the post, I know, you know, Virginia sometimes will come in and double. So I don't know if you guys are doing any of that. And also off, off ball screens, you know, come to mind too. I know some teams switch, some teams are like, we're fighting through at all costs. Um, so just curious, some of the things that you're doing, you know, I know pressure defensive teams tend to be a little more aggressive with what they're doing, even in the half court. So curious how, how that all lines up for you as well. So I've used this term, but even though uh, there are elements of the pack that I didn't like, what I did like was that gap defensive pressure. And so I still use the term gap if you're one pass away, you know, to traditional help if you're two or more passes away. <clears throat> but what, what playing kind of that gap help defense allows you to do is anything off the ball. Most of the time we were just shooting the gap or shooting in between. Um, but you're still kind of hovering around the paint. So you're almost not, you're basically just readjusting your position. You're not chasing guys around the floor, which I felt like at times that was, that could potentially happen <clears throat> depending on where they're sending players. So, you know, that, that is a little bit easier as far as doubling the post. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we do. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I will send different guys at different times. So we had the last couple of years, we had a six, five point guard and um, off offensively point guards are not used when a ball goes into a post, a point guard stands and watches, which is easy 
for you defensively because he's not going to do anything. And so we would send our point guard down to double. And so he was coming from all random areas on the floor. And then we would just split the last two in the backside and wherever the ball went, that guy was following and the point guard would run to the open man. So, you know, that we'll do that. Sometimes I would traditional uh, double with the four. Um, so send him at times depending. So, you know, that, that's kind of the same traditionally as far as like practicing the, the double and then the rotations. Um, you know, as teams kind of move away from the traditional post player, that, that changes a little bit. But we're still playing at our level. We still play three or four Division One teams every year, and they always have a post player. And so um, I've had success even at our, you know, us being several notches below those Division One teams. I've had success going and doubling the post. Uh, we're, we're playing those teams early in the season, so they really haven't worked on that yet and seen that yet. So we'll get we'll have some success with that. But I would encourage players. I know it's not new. I'm sure most of your listeners have, have heard it before, but like practice or just try um, sending different guys. You'll find that some guys are great at it and some guys stink at it, but they can be taught, taught it. I've seen um, usually the athletic ones do pretty well, long arm, obviously. Um, your smarter players, if they can react quickly and get down there, but send different players. You know, obviously, if the ball comes in and our doubler is, I've actually had this. So I'll give you the example of the point guard. So his man is the one that fed the post. We'll just have him turn and actually just dig a little bit. And I'll have a second guy who I assign. So I'll say, if he's not able to go, then you're going to go. And that kind of keeps all the players alert on the floor because they're constantly thinking like, all right, is it my turn? Is it, is it me who's able to go? And I think that has really allowed us to play as five on the court because they're all ready to go rather than, well, that's not my assignment because I'm not that player. Um, they know that their responsibilities potentially could be there depending on where they are on the floor or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, um, and I'll just say this too. I know you're a proponent of this, but we play a ton. We play a ton three on three. We play a ton five on five. We just play a ton because of that. We, we don't want to just sit and practice one guy going and double in the post or, you know, one guy playing half court defense. Well, you're the, you three on the team are the ones and you're going to be the ones who are always stopping the ball in transition. Like we practice everybody. The big guys like it because sometimes they're the point guard in the in the ball screen scenarios, which is just a mess. But like they they just do it, and so everybody gets reps of, of guarding ball screens in both positions. And um, but when you play, you get more opportunities to be able to have those scenarios. So yeah, I, I would suggest that you kind of tinker with it, um, but but let them play and and kind of experiment with it and find out how to how to do it better on their own. Coach, just an, another question as we, um, we talked a little bit about the half court and then also looking at the full court. One of the things I know we had to deal with a lot in the full court was kind of communicating to fix it. Once the ball got on the, in the half court, there's times when you uh, double team and you end up getting matched up with other players. And I know some coaches, they like to really keep the integrity of their matchups and they really want to you have this player and we're not switching anything, we'll hard hedge, we'll recover at all costs. So how do you manage that with the press where you, you, you know, I know you can fix it, so to speak, yeah. in the half court, but obviously there's times where you might have some of those other matchups. Are you okay with that? Um, and, and how much do you guys have to work on that? Yeah, I mean, there's some times where, I mean, as, as soon as it happens, the head coach and I talk a lot and he's, he'll sit next to me on the bench and, you know, I'll just say underneath my breath, like we're screwed because the fact of the matter is like that, you just know that that ball is going to find that guy. That's not who you want guarding him. Um, it really magnifies itself when we're playing those D2 and D1 games. But um, the truth is, is that we played a lot this year with five guys who were very similar. And I think, Two, some coaches are going to hear that and be like, well, I don't have that luxury, so that's not going to work for me. Um, I really do believe that because of the style of offense that we play, as well as the type of defense that we play, <clears throat> we're a lot of times playing just our best five guys or, you know, the best five out of the top eight guys. And the fact of the matter is, if you give them the opportunity to play a lot, this is another reason why I think it's important for you to play a ton is that they're going to get experience in practice 
and we switch. We'll switch one through five most of the time. Usually the last, at least third, last half of the season, <clears throat> we will on defense switch everything. So off ball, on ball, everything, we switch. And that results in some things that if you were in the stands, you'd see our center guarding a three or a two, and you're like, oh, man, that's going to be a mismatch. But to be honest with you, our center by the end of the year did a great job moving his feet and staying in front um, and absorbing those drives. And But I think it was because he was put in situations every day in practice where he had to do that. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a, oh, man, this is the first time this has ever happened or this is unique once the game came because he was he had to do that every day in practice and so again I just think it's another reason why you should practice playing a lot in practice is so that guys can get opportunities to to guard positions that they wouldn't normally because I mean how many times do we do one rep everybody's guarding who they want who they're supposed to be guarding and then the rep's over and we blow the whistle and we reorganize everything and everybody goes back to guard and their same guy again. I just, that's just not realistic. And I think in the long run, that really hurts you. Yeah. And the more, more opportunities uh, you have to let the players go out there and be involved in those small sided games or three versus three situations, five versus five is obviously helpful. So it looks like you have a drill here um, that you can share with us because I'm curious, as you build your defensive system and you're talking about the full court and half court elements that you have to work with, is there anything that you use with your team other coaches might want to see? Yeah, this one is called attack 33. You can also do it attack 44 where you're playing four on four. And we actually will do sometimes attack 55 where we have all five guys on the floor. But these players, one and X1, will actually start on the other side of the court and we give one almost a running start. The coach starts with the ball. We'll throw it to one on the move. That's why you see kind of one with a small advantage there. That may be a little bit too much of an advantage, but something like that where they're able to catch the ball and then to dribble. And what you're creating is just a really quick scoring opportunity. We put about 10 seconds on the floor. And so they play out of that. And it doesn't, you don't have to force something where they just dribble in and shoot or whatever. But, you know, you're working on if your team takes away the corner shooter, then you got to take the corner shooter. If, you're got, if your team provides help from this side, if this guy stunts, like you just play three on three. I think sometimes we think of three on three, like at the top, the wing and the wing, and then we play out of it. Like you can move your three on three all over the floor and create scenarios. We'll put them sometimes in like three on three ball screen situations where we have a corner ball and then a guy come up and set a screen and play three on three out of that. But this attack 33, you do the 44, you'll put another person on this side of the floor. Attack 55, we'll put the fifth guy over here. So you have one, two, three, four, like your trail guy, and then five underneath the basket. And it's just real quick. And we'll, we'll say basically, you know, white team, you got 10 opportunities to score. And then after the white team goes, then, okay, blue team, you got 10 opportunities to score. So it's best out of 10. Um, and the guys really like that because it's really quick. <clears throat> they rotate to different positions on the floor. They have to sometimes be the guy that's guarding the ball. They have to sometimes be the guy on the corner shooter, sometimes the person providing help from the backside, sometimes the person over here that uh, uh, providing additional help or help the helper. I mean, you can recreate pretty much anything. And again, it's kind of fast paced. <clears throat> you know, we'll do a lot of small segments where you're only only playing or doing a drill, a small sided game for, for eight minutes or for five minutes or whatever. And so this is one that they really like. Um, there are some others that you've probably seen. <clears throat> this one that I that we'll do is we'll just do, you know, two on two where they dribble around the cone and you got a small advantage. Um, this one is looks a little bit confusing, but it basically just turns into three on three. So it's pass, pass, pass. <clears throat> on the pass, this guy starts to close out because closeouts are really important in the type of defense that we play. On the second pass, this guy starts to close out to two. And on the third pass, he'll sprint and close out to help. And then they'll play three on three. So again, you're just here, whatever skills are most important. So for us, it's, you know, taking away corner shooter, closeouts, contesting shots, rebounding. <clears throat> those are the types of things that we're trying to implement in those, those small-sided games. And, you know, there's a ton of other ones I know you provide a ton as well. But 
again, it goes back to the point of preparing them for scenarios that they'll face in games and allowing everybody to see the different scenarios and to get in as many reps as possible because, right, like you're trying to give them as many opportunities to practice as possible. And we found that basically doing the, the shorter type drills allows you to get those different reps and to practice on different spots on the floor. What I love about Attack 33 and, and really all of these um, small-sided games that you shared is there's so many benefits to them. And I know, you know, really with all SSGs and games based, that's why coaches are doing it. But thinking about that Attack 33 and, you know, you have a transition situation, defensive player sprinting back, closeouts, rotations, so many mm-hmm. different things that are going on. And obviously the decision-making aspect on offense as well. So there's just so many benefits, you know, to using these in practice and obviously, um, you know, for defense. And you mentioned closeout, so I have to ask you, um, and I know this is something that is different for coaches. There's fly-by closeouts and traditional closeouts and glide, glide closeouts. And there's so many different things, but what do you guys use with your team and, and why does it work for you in terms of closing out? Yeah, so I mean, we for a long time were just doing the short choppies, and the fa- the truth is, is that <clears throat> we were giving up nine, ten, eleven, twelve threes a game, and we got sick of it. And so I got rid of the short choppies. We sprint, and it's sprint and almost kind of like a <clears throat> side type hockey stop, um, but they they don't they don't hockey stop with their middle foot in the center of a guy's body. It's closing out with leverage, and so we're sprinting and hockey stopping. <clears throat> so that our body directs them to the baseline. And that's, again, something that changed because, you know, a pack line, you're closing out and influencing them towards that elbow. So that changed this year. So you sprint out, you close out with your inside hand. So if I'm on the, the right side of the floor, I'm closing out with my left hand to push them to the baseline. If I'm on the other side of the floor, I'm sprinting out and closing out um, the the flybys. I feel like as soon as you fly by, even if it's a good contest, <clears throat> you're now eliminating yourself from the play. Um, some will like that because that just sends the guy now into transition offense on the other side of the floor. Um, but you know, for us, I would rather them close out high hand. I try to teach them to set, be the second guy that jumps off the floor. That's something that you have to drill. I know some people are like, that doesn't work. I'm trying to contest your face. And so if I can jump up and contest your face, not block the shot, but contest your face, you can be the second person off the floor and contest in somebody's face. So, you know, we try to teach jump. If the guy jumps, be the second guy, but quickly jump off the floor. Um, you know, I like the hockey stop because you're just closing out, stopping, planting, and then going. And if you close out the right way, he's only got one place to go, and it's to the baseline. So you know where he's going. And then that ties into what we started with, right? I'm going to beat him to that spot on the short corner so I don't get blown by. You know, that's, again, just one of those things that as I'm thinking through it, I want everything to be connected. I want everything to set up the next thing. And, you know, so teaching it that way where I'm closing out with my inside hand, pushing them towards the baseline. Sure, if they start to drive, that's fine. I'm not going to I'm not going to give them a wide open pass to the lane. But my player's mentality is I contested the shot. They didn't shoot. What's next? My next thing is I go and I beat them to the spot on the baseline so that I can cut them off on the baseline. Um, So again, that's just another example of everything being connected so that they just naturally play without having to think through things. I really like the the hockey style closeout, to be honest. I was kind of traditional choppy steps, high hands. And um, I, I like what you guys are doing because there's that opportunity to close out and recover. As you mentioned, the flybys, you're almost creating an advantage for the opponent. Um, But I'm sure that works for the teams that use it. I think, you know, the people that drill it and their players know it, you could probably argue for all three of them. But I really like what you guys are doing. Um, And I I remember you talking about this. It might have been in one of the chats or you might have posted it. But I do remember you talking about those closeouts previously. So we've we've covered a lot in terms of – uh, you know, defending pick and roll and off ball screens, half court, and full court, you know, de- as coaches are kind of building their system and even closeouts there. Is there anything else that you, you're doing or keying in on as you're kind of building your full court and your half court defensive systems that we might not have talked about yet? 
Yeah, I think the last thing is just the ball pressure and how important that is in the full court and in the half court. Um, you know, even in the full court, there are times where I think at the beginning you think I have to be so good at keeping the ball in front of me and the ball can never, I can't get beat, I can't get beat, I can't get beat. When your guy gets beat, like you're angry. We actually practice getting beat. But again, it's one of those things, if you get beat, then you naturally rotate to the next guy up. Um, and you'll actually sometimes get deflections and steals as that guy thinks, oh, well, that guy's open and he goes to pass it. And the guy who was guarding him that you just beat gets the tip or gets the deflection. So we'll actually practice from the backside, you know, getting beat and then recovering to the next guy up. Um, the next person in line would then take that guy. Um, you know, this is hard to coaches probably if they're listening still are going to be thinking like, man, I, I don't know exactly what he's talking about. Our head coach did a one of those virtual clinics with uh, with this and he has a, it's all on coach tube and I would encourage them to to get that. Um, and then if they listen to this, they'll kind of see how it, the two of them kind of mesh together. But even in the half court, uh, we talked we started with talking about going down the roof making sure that you're on the ball close enough that you're <clears throat> influencing to where you want him to go, but not so close. You know, we talk about giving them kind of like that little cushion so that you're not so close that you get blown by or that you foul. That was something that we had to really focus on the last half of the season this last year. Um, so yeah, the ball pressure is extremely important <clears throat> because as coaches, we know that's important for feeding the posts. That's important for contesting shots. Um, you know, the, the, on the ball pressure, it really starts with, with your offense's effectiveness starts with what happens on the ball. And so I think really we'll spend time at the beginning of the year, everybody does the zigzag drill, right? I would encourage you to start with the zigzag drill. And then once you get to half court and implement that roof drill and keeping them to that side of the floor <clears throat> and, and helping your players see how the two of them tie together. I think too many times we as coaches, understand how the four components of basketball tie together in our system, but our players don't. And so they don't quite understand how the transition defense goes together with the defense. And sometimes we do a poor job of, of our drills, right? That's why we love those small sided games, <clears throat> because if you do them right, you can tie different components of the game together, like you already said. But if I'm old school and I'm practicing ball screens, and then I go on and practice rebounding, and then I go on and practice contesting shots and your players never see the, the connection between those things. And I think that you end up with a less than effective or not as strong defense as you could have if your players really did understand how everything fit together. Just uh, one, one last question on ball pressure. Um, I know you talked a little bit about this, but always curious because I, I get different. It's different for everybody, obviously, one of those things. But is there any... Um, you know, specific expectations for players. I've heard some some coaches an arms length away, some coaches there's a kind of cushion zone, that imaginary zone they want their players to be in. So um, for you guys to obviously effectively put pressure on the ball, are there any uh, expectations that you have or is it different from player to player? Um, how, does that, how does that work for you? I think as coaches, we would love everybody to be the same, right? Like you, you should be able to be a lockdown ball defender. But the reality is, is that my senior is, is better at it than my junior. My junior is better at my than my sophomore. And I think it really gives us as coaches an opportunity <clears throat> for them to help learn how to be self-aware. Like, bro, you can't guard that guy. You need to come off of him, right? And, and just being honest, but also allowing them to have success. If I want to be so stubborn that I say to you, you know, John, you need to go guard the ball and your guy is just torching you over and over and over. Like that's going to defeat you. But if I say to you, like, you know, just take a couple steps off of him, but keep him in front of you and you have some success. I know that John is a freshman. You're not going to be very good. But by the time you get to be a senior, you're going to be smart about angles. And you're going to learn to get better at it. And so, you know, as a coach, I'm, I'm expect, there is a certain level that I want all of them. Like they have to be able to stay in front of the ball. But I would rather them use their brains to be able to stay in front of the ball rather than just expecting them to all be athletic enough or fast enough to stay in front. Because again, if I'm allowing, if I'm saying we're going to switch one through five, then there's going to be times where there's going to be somebody who's guarding somebody that they have no shot. If I'm going to say to them, 
everybody across the board is arm's length away. And if you're not, you're not playing. Like, that's just stupid. And so, and it's not realistic. And so, you know, again, if I'm going to say we're all going to switch, you're expected to guard everybody, then, then what I teach, my expectation <clears throat> needs to match that. And I think, again, sometimes as coaches, we have this, like, we're going to do it this way and this way and this way and this way. And if you can't, then you're not going to play. And we don't have the success that we could because we're too stubborn to change the way that we did it because we have this pie in the sky, lofty expectation <clears throat> that really isn't, it, it really isn't realistic. No, it's a great point. I, you know, with, with our defense, um, had a, a player who was great at anticipating getting steals off the ball. They were, they were probably the slowest player I had on the floor, but they were really good in that role and they anticipated really well on the ball. They had to be back off their person. And obviously we tried to not put them in positions in the press where they were going to be up defending, but there was times where it happened and we had to be okay with that. And I think that's a really great point because every player is different, but what they didn't give us, in ball pressure away from the ball, uh, they, they were just great. They were getting their hands and a lot of deflections and, and passes and things like that. So that's a really, really great point. Um, as, as we transition here to the end, um, just thinking about coaches who are watching this, um, is there any advice that you know you would give to them as they start to build their system and they're really thinking about, hey, I'd, I'd like to have a full court element and I'd like to also have that half court aspect and be good at both. Uh, what advice would you give to coaches as they start to think about that? Yeah, I mean, the first thing would just simply be <clears throat> be willing to continue to learn and continue to change because the game does change. And so what things are, again, it's a question that we had to really focus on, what matters to winning? <clears throat> what things are going to allow us to have a position or be in a position to win? And I think there are some constants. We've talked about some of those constants. But, like, find out what that is to whatever your defensive system you want to play and then drill those things over and over and over. Understand that you're not going to be great at everything, but the things that could potentially get you a win or slow down the other team or, you know, give you a chance against the best team in your league, those are the things that you should be practicing on a regular basis. And so, you know, I would say be great at certain things, focus on those things, but drill those things every day in practice and drill them through those small side of games like we worked on. Because again, what you emphasize is what your players think is going to be most important and you better, what they think is most important better be the things that actually give you a shot at winning games. Great advice, Coach, and so many uh, great points in this. You took us through, really, everything you guys do defensively. You gave us a piece of of your whole system. So I feel like maybe some coaches out there uh, might have some follow-up questions, and I know you're very active on uh, social media. If coaches want to reach out to you, you want to just share your uh, Twitter handle? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just just look at at Tony W. Miller. Um, you know, there's a ton of stuff there. <clears throat> I do some stuff for Fast Model and for Dr. Dish. If you see that name pop across, that's me. Just feel free to shoot me a DM. My direct messages are open, and I'm more than happy to help out any way that I can. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And I hope, uh, you know, I know coaches are really going to enjoy this, and I hope they also uh, check out your Quick Time Out podcast and your Coffee with the Coaches. I know that I follow along. I learn a lot from you as a coach. Appreciate all that you have to share. Uh, So thank you again for joining us. Absolutely. Appreciate all that you do as well, Coach. Thank you.